Hello and welcome to Movies, A Million Movies. Today I'm going to be talking about the first and one of the best James Bond movies, Dr. No. It's the movie that drew the blueprint for all the Bond films to follow and had a huge impact on everything from what we see on television to what women wear to the beach. So grab a martini and sit back as I walk you through some useless facts you don't need to know about the 1962 classic, Dr. No. Unfortunately, I misjudged you. You are just a stupid policeman whose luck is run out. Dr. No was not the obvious choice for the first of Ian Fleming's books to be made into a feature film. In fact, Dr. No was the sixth title in the series, and three later novels were already published before production began on Dr. No. The movie's producers, Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli, originally wanted to make Thunderball first, but that title was locked up in legal challenges. So what made Dr. No move to the front of the line ahead of the seven other possible stories? The answer is simple, literally. The plot wasn't very complicated. Most of it could be shot in a single location, Jamaica in this case, and Dr. No's lair was the only complicated set they needed to build. Altogether, these factors added up to a relatively simple production which would be the safest bet for the studio executives who were not 100% sold that a James Bond movie would bring anyone into the theaters. Of course, one of the biggest decisions the production team had to make once the title was selected was who would play the part of James Bond. Now, to build buzz, the producers initially launched a Find James Bond contest in England. The winner was Peter Anthony, who, while he had the look to play Bond, was not an actor. Trevor Howard, and Michael Redgrave were also up for the part, but Cubby Broccoli was positive that Sean Connery was the man to play the role. Broccoli sent Connery's screen test to United Artists for approval and got a telegram back telling him, no, keep trying. As the start date for the production got closer and closer, Broccoli used his position and insisted on casting Connery in the role. The studio execs weren't the only ones who didn't want to see Sean Connery play Bond. Bond's creator, Ian Fleming, didn't like him for the part either. Strikes against Connery in Fleming's eyes were that Connery was Scottish, Bond is English, Connery came from a working class background while Bond is upper class, and Connery was rugged and a little rough. Bond was refined and educated. However, after seeing the finished film, Fleming changed his mind and thought Connery was actually a great Bond. In fact, in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Fleming gave Bond a Scottish ancestry. Now, while Sean Connery may have had the look and the style to play Bond, he didn't share Bond's fearlessness. Connery, it turns out, is deathly afraid of spiders. So to get the shot of Bond with a tarantula crawling on him, the crew placed a sheet of glass between the spider and Connery. For the close-ups, stuntman Bob Simmons took over for Connery. It turns out that Simmons was also afraid of spiders. He called this stunt the scariest one he ever performed. Bonus fun fact, the tarantula's name was Rosie. One of the most iconic shots found in all James Bond movies is the sequence at the beginning of each movie where the camera is looking down a gun barrel as Bond walks by. Before the gun can fire at him though, Bond pivots and shoots the assassin. Only that's not Sean Connery firing at the assassin. The man we see there is, once again, stuntman Bob Simmons. Simmons, who ended up being a stuntman or a stunt coordinator on all but two of the Bond films, from Dr. No in 1962 through A View to the Kill in 1985, had his version of the gun barrel shot appear in From Russia With Love and Goldfinger. It wasn't until the fourth film, Thunderball, that Sean Connery took over and appeared in the sequence. Another iconic element from the Bond movies is, of course, the theme song. While John Barry often gets credit for the song thanks to his amazing arrangement, the song was actually written by songwriter Monty Norman. Norman based the theme on the song he'd written called Good Sign, Bad Sign for a never produced musical. The story for the musical came from V.S. Naipaul's novel A House for Mr. Biswas. And since the story focused on Indian characters, the song was written to be played on the sitar. I was born with this unlucky sneeze And what is worse, I came into the world the wrong way round Pundits all agree that I'm the reason why my father fell Into the village pond and drowned 
Now, when John Barry orchestrated the song, he converted the sitar part into the now famous electric guitar melody. It's not a real Bond film without a couple of Bond girls, and Dr. No set a standard for that as well, starting with Eunice Gason as Sylvia Trench. Originally, that part was supposed to be played by Lois Maxwell, but Maxwell didn't feel comfortable in the part, especially when she found out that she'd be required to appear in one scene wearing nothing but one of Bond's shirts. Instead, Maxwell took the role of Miss Moneypenny, a part she continued to play in the next 14 Bond movies. Eunice Gason's part as Sylvia Trench was also supposed to be a repeating role for her at least the next five movies, and while she did appear in From Russia with Love, unfortunately her character was dropped from the other films. The other Bond girl in Dr. No is the character Honey Ryder, played by Ursula Andress. The producers originally considered Julie Christie for the part, but didn't feel she had the sex appeal they wanted for this role, and two weeks before production was to begin, the part was still unfilled. That was until John Derrick sent the producers a photo of his wife, Ursula Andress. The producers were so impressed with her look that they offered Andress, who was an unknown actress at the time, the part without even meeting her. The gamble paid off, and Ursula Andress became an international star following her appearance in Dr. No. A big part of her impact was her memorable first appearance on screen as she walked out of the surf with the conch shells she'd collected. At the time, bikinis were still somewhat new and were seen as a novelty, but thanks to her appearance in the custom-made ones she wore, bikini sales skyrocketed and became the new standard for women's beachwear. In the long line of Bond villains, we've seen some unforgettable characters like Ulrich Goldfinger, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, Fiona Volpe, and Rosa Klebb. Dr. No easily ranks in the top 10 of my favorite Bond villains, frankly because he was the first to bring so many of the classic Bond villain elements to the screen. He was an elitist genius who lives in a secret lair, changed his figurement, robotic hands, and an army of devoted henchmen. And he was played wonderfully by Joseph Weissman. But Joseph Weissman was not everyone's first choice for the part. Ian Fleming wanted his cousin Christopher Lee to play the part. He also thought Noel Coward could do the role, but Coward refused in part because he'd have to wear those robotic hands. A third candidate, Max von Sydow, turned down the part as well. Interestingly, both Christopher Lee and Max von Sydow would eventually play Bond villains. Lee as Francisco Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun, and von Sydow as Blofeld in Never Say Never Again. As for Noel Coward, he never appeared in a Bond film. As I mentioned, Dr. No had a fantastic secret lair. It's even more fantastic when you realize that production designer Ken Adam built everything in the movie for less than 15,000 pounds. One feature Adam wanted to include was a giant aquarium. He couldn't afford to build a real one, so he used a rear projection screen that would show stock footage of fish swimming by. Unfortunately, the only stock footage the crew could afford was of goldfish-sized fish. So. They enlarged the projection and added a line about the aquarium magnifying the image of the fish to the script. The glass is convex, 10 inches thick, which accounts for the magnifying effect. Minnows pretending they're whales, just like you on this island, Dr. No. And passed off small guppies as giant fish. In fact, Ken Adams' set was so impressive that Stanley Kubrick hired him the following year to be the production designer on Dr. Strangelove, where he created an equally impressive set. One more feature of the set that showed Ken Adams' creativity is this sequence where Bond stops to admire a painting in Dr. No's lair. Adam thought that Dr. No should have some style and taste, so he mixed in antiques with the contemporary pieces. He decided to include this painting, which is Goya's portrait of the Duke of Wellington, in Dr. No's collection. The real portrait had been stolen from the National Gallery in London the year before, so it's no surprise that a stolen piece of classic art would catch Bond's eye. To make the painting, Adams got a slide of the original from the National Gallery and painted a copy over the weekend before the scene was filmed. And, like the real Goya, Adams' fake Goya was also stolen after filming was completed. And one final fact to highlight about Dr. No is how timely it was. Just a few days after the premiere in England, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. 
Now, the similarities between the fictional story in Dr. No and the real story happening on the news brought a lot of attention to the film and built a lot of buzz for the movie. Even so, there was concern about how the film would do in the United States. United Artists did a test run at a drive-in theater in Oklahoma. Audiences loved it, and the film ultimately made nearly $60 million on a production budget of just $1.1 million. And there you have it, my list of useless facts about Dr. No that you can use to impress or annoy your friends with. And if you like my videos, I hope you will take a second to subscribe to my channel. If you do, you'll get a notification whenever I post a new video. And be sure to come back next Monday morning when I'll have another episode to share with you. Until then, as always, thank you for watching A Million Movies, and I hope to see you again soon.